dear friends welcome back to cash at loan master course our daily master classes during 19 days of the cash at loan virtual cash at loan we transmitted 17 master classes three concerts two lectures almost like master course at the kibbutz elon four more days of exciting music making and today i am so happy to introduce you an outstanding violinist pedagogue Ilya kaller hello itzak thank you so much uh greetings warm greetings to everybody who is attending this virtual class uh this is leonid baranov our first performer a wonderful young violinist who i had a chance to work with in the past and today he will be performing a, a wonderful work isai sonata number no. four in e minor for violin solo i assume probably will be working on the first movement right uh, that would be just enough time and uh we have actually two works today that we'll be working on this is a sonata and later Christ Richard Stephen Scherzo performed by uh, another young talented violinist Margarita Pavlova uh, and these two works connected in a very interesting way of course because they both uh, bear you might say name of great Fritz Chrysler in case of is sonata it's a dedication to Chrysler and Richard Stephen Scherzo written by him so more about it later so Leonid please now we'll hear your recording
Bravo, bravo, Lenit. Absolutely beautiful playing. Always Thank uh, you, enjoyed Carter. your playing. I mean, you have such a natural rapport with instrument, very organic connection with it. Instrumentally, this is something I really love about your playing, full of temperament and real, real involvement, emotional involvement in what you're doing. Great intonation and sound, everything. I would like to, to say a few words about about style of this music. Uh, uh, in the violin repertoire, I think, uh, comp violinist composers like Isai and before him, Vinyavsky, Vitan, they take special place. And I think it's, it's worthwhile to really study that style. We have some hint at that style if you listen to old archive recordings of great masters by Isai himself, even though he never recorded this, this piece, or Chrysler and so forth. Something that could be called elevated or emphatic style of expression. Uh, I always like to talk about it to my students. It's not a kind of a, a colloquial, casual way of uh, delivering the emotional musical message, but slightly exaggerating. And in some cases, it's marked actually in the music in a very interesting way. All these accents and dashes, I think, should be taken very seriously and actually sometimes slightly exaggerated even. Uh, you tend... Uh, I mean, beauty of your sound and smoothness of execution are admirable, but sometimes I think you, mm, um, I would say, homogenize that a little bit. Even at the end, when you have this chords... Uh, there should be a little bit more, uh, not forced, but f I would say forceful. You understand? So everything yes. is spoken in a kind of exaggerated, blown-up way, like... Good morning, my dear friend. This kind of a, this kind of a, a delivery, you understand? The same, I would say, the first three notes at the beginning. You treat this uh, three 30-second uh, notes more like a, just a regular upbeat leading directly into the next bar. But if you, for example, make first note a little bit heavier, it changes a little bit the shape of this group of notes. Uh, instead of... You understand? Uh, yeah. creates a little bend in a phrase. Can we try that? Ya da da dim, the first note. Yeah. yeah, I would say, yeah, wonderful. I would say that uh, it would work better if you give a little bit more bow in the first note. Do not start so close to the frog. Uh, somewhere here, uh, you can be more generous with the bow, with the first note. Try that. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. That's, that's great, that's great, that's great. That's closer to what I think, I think it should be. Now, because you have several phrases, which basically based on the same rhythmic pattern, it would be uh, also instructive to know that they never traditionally were performed at the same, exactly the same tempo. I mean, overall tempo is the same, of course, but you have to drive, uh, drive the speed forward just a little bit. Lenny, I think you froze. Yes. So every time you go to next phrase. Yeah. So forth. you have to really push it forward. You understand? Yeah. And then when you reach this point, uh, you can really expand. You understand? Otherwise, it turns into just no matter how beautifully played, just mechanical repetition of this of the same phrase with slightly different notes in it. Yeah. Can we? Can you try that? Perhaps the last one, very good. The last one, do not wait so much. Maybe here. Uh, yeah, and going all the way up. Yeah, we don't have to repeat it, just to keep yeah. that in mind. So okay. that everything, when you have a sequence of something, yeah, uh, it never, the elements of the sequence never come at the same rate, you understand? So it either slows down, but in most cases like this one, because the whole thing moves up. 
speech wise you have to push it forward a little bit and then on the top you expand yeah that that would be much more uh, much more natural this way now talking about this accents and dashes and everything uh, it's not always observed but I would suggest that you look at that main theme of it when you have In some cases, Isaiah adds dash. Like for example, here. Uh, I believe it means separation between the notes. You understand? Like in case of also this one. Uh, but at the beginning, they're simply connected. Isaiah puts accent, but this accent is still under the slur. So it's a. Uh, Understand? Yes. Can we try that? Yeah, yeah. Try to, try to, yeah. What I suggest, I think it has something to do also with bow distribution. If you use less bow on the longer note and use almost half on the short, you understand? You'll be able to connect them. So it's more like a ay, yay, yay, this kind of articulation. Instead of pa pam, instead of a separation, you understand? So it's a. And in this case, uh, yeah, in this case, when you separate, I suggest even to produce tiny, tiny, slight retake with the bow. So you have more. And, uh, you understand? Because simply hook doesn't quite do it. Yeah. Now, these double accents, which you see in many works, in many of that time, but when you have a, several fast moving notes with accents on each one of them. I believe this is a, one of the ways describing rubatos. For example, even when you deal with these two 64th notes, you see, they, they, have, they have two accents. What does it mean? That you play them faster or you punch each note individually? I don't think so. I think what it is, is a... So it's more about the first note of the two. Yeah, if you pull it out a little bit, make it longer, it creates this very peculiar rubato feeling among these two notes. Like, for example, the beginning. Uh... Yeah, it's a little bit like in the third sonata you have. You understand? So it's this is what creates this kind of an emphatic uh, expression. Can, can you try it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, even sorry. longer. Yeah. Even longer first note, yeah? Yeah, and second quicker, yeah? So it's... Uh, Ya da di, you understand? Exactly, exactly. So in my, so in my humble opinion, what do I know? But in my humble opinion, the accents make notes bigger, not, not smaller. You understand? So they, they much heavier, make them heavier. Now, uh, when you uh, he, uh, go to this cadence. It was really beautiful and to relax the sound and so forth. But you probably know, maybe you don't, that Isaiah actually wrote because it never appeared in the in editions before in, in the, that famous French edition that was republished many times in different countries, including my old country, where we, we had the edition of Isaiah Sanatans, basically, you know, a new old country where it was simply stolen from that French edition, had a lot of mistakes. Isaiah actually writes, toujours forte, et très rythmé in this case so just making sure that you continue uh, with the same uh, again uh, yeah can we try it once just keep going forward to the very end to, mm -hmm. to tra tranquilo section Yeah, yeah. So 
Only one note. Very good. Uh. Yeah, the same thing. The ya ba ba dee. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't know exactly what is A meant here, but if you look at the music, you see there's no diminuendo really to the end. And then you have basically subito piano, cami and tranquillo. Uh, experiment with both. I mean, what you're doing is very convincing, of course, yeah, but it's not exactly what, what he put on the page there. Yeah, be careful with the triplet here. Yeah, don't uh, scramble it. I don't see necessity in lifting the bow before that chord and just slamming it back to the string. Uh, and then tranquilo. Okay. Now, one more thing you might uh, you, you might try to do, and this is something that is not clearly marked, but you have... You might consider breaking this chord upside down to show the, the lower voice better. You know what I mean? Because it sounds now... Uh, which cannot be a voicing, really. You understand? Sometimes uh, with chords, because violin is not really a polyphonic instrument, you have to uh, have come up with the ways of playing chords in such a way that we can follow the leading voice much easier. You understand? Now, the following section, I think it could be, it, even though it's a tranquilo, but I don't think it should be that static. I think you play it a little bit too, too even. Yeah, you can also phrase here, uh, for example, so within every bar there's a little bit of a, of a forward motion. And so forth. Can you try that? Tiny, tiny rubato. Yeah, so not just showing up upper voice, but moving a little bit forward within each bar. Yeah, so the third note, third note, the top note, the top note, make a little bit longer, mm -hmm. right? So this is a... Uh... And then you can pull out another note, not necessarily one which comes with the third beat. Could be first beat, could be second beat, and so forth. Yeah, but don't play ta ra mm -hmm. ra di ra You understand? Yeah. So they're exactly the same. Yeah. yeah? We don't have to do it. Now, okay. uh, the same things that basically I mentioned to you, they're applicable to this section of... See? moment this modulation to D major I mm -hmm. would say that you could you, uh, it's a good idea here even to take both of the string and to kind of uh, re-articulate that chord the yam the yam beam when you come to dominant harmony of D major can we try that if you could start from forte di, ya, da, di, im, ba, ba, yeah the same thing then it first note di, ya, da, di, im, ba, ba, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. 
Definitely. So now it sounds really important, you understand? Very majestic, grand. I think this is closer to what it should be like. Now, the Morto Tranquilo section, uh, you use a little bit less vibrato, but I think you could go even further with that. Yeah, to really play with this almost white sound, almost. Yeah, I call it quasi non, non vibrato. So vibrato is present, but very little, like really residually only, right? So if you ever have a chance, or maybe you already did, if you listen to uh, to recordings of Isai playing uh, Berceuse by Gabriel Fauré, he uses this almost almost non-existent vibrato, but you can still hear it in the sound. So if you reduce vibrato really to the first joint of your finger, you understand, without moving even the wrist, yeah? Like this, so like you're vibrating in, into the string. It will still produce oscillations, but they will be tiny, 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 like you're humming something, you understand? Can we try that? And try in that section to keep piano as long as possible, yeah? Because first crescendo appears only in the, in, in the third line of this section, yeah? Can we try it? Yeah, even less, Leonid, Leonid, even less, even less. I can see this part is moving. The... Okay. Yeah, slightly firmer finger pressure on the string. Yeah, that will mm -hmm. prevent your finger from oscillating too much. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's it. Yeah, that, right. So keep... Yeah, so keep fingers very close, like a little bit, like 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 mm -hmm. the kind of a fist-like shape, yeah? So that makes vibrato yeah. a little bit more tight, more narrow, not tight, but narrow. Yeah, the, I think this is the, the kind of color color you want here. Uh, and can we hear a little bit uh, from this part to the end? It could be too much to ask, but you think you could vibrate a little bit that tenth also? Again, vibrate with the first finger. And then I suggest this finger in here. Four, then two. Two, two. As opposed to this, you see? Because you have tritone there. So you don't you don't cross finger this thing. Yeah? So you play four, uh, four, four, two, two. Ah. Four, four, two, two in upper voice. Try that. Okay. Exactly. You see? And there are a number of cases like this. Whenever you see in the sequence of double stops, tritone, you have to always remember. So if you, you go to, uh, from tritone and to tritone, you go with one finger moving half step. Yeah? You cannot cross finger. You yeah. don't jump. Yeah? I mean, it's, it's possible, of course, to do, but it will never sound as, as clean and well connected. So it's a... Try it. Let's try uh, that little uh, segment. That's right. Here, I would I would suggest you stick to fingerings of suggested by Isai. Not all of those fingerings are extremely practical. They're very interesting from historic standpoint, of course, and it's a wonderful document uh, testifying to his own approach to fingering. But in this case, I would really follow it. So when he suggests third, going to D string here rather than staying in the first position. Mm -hmm. Make it bigger. You're doing it, but I think you should exaggerate slightly those accents, of course. Yeah. Can we try maybe bar before that? Uh, uh. 
from here, right? Yes, yes. I think if you, I don't think you should strive to strike three strings sim simultaneously in those chords. It's unnecessary. If you could slide your roll them. Uh... It sounds a little bit flat, loud but flat, yeah? So you, you roll, so you, you make even more emphasis on upper voice. I suggest, I suggest you don't use the whole bow because it's in a strange way it chops up those chords. So if you use about half, look, yeah, it's easy to connect them because you go. See, even here, there's no need to use the whole bow. Just a little bit less than whole bow, but it's easy to connect. Yat, 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 to be fully sustained, mm -hmm. right? Try that. Yeah, for example here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't leave the ball. Yeah, it's all sustained. Yeah, because you're lifting it's more than once. More than once, you tend to lift bow before down, down bow. Ta, tiam, pam. Yeah, stay on the string. Yeah, the same thing. Yeah, the same. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah, yeah, don't lift the bow. Yeah, because it breaks the line, you understand? Stay on the strings, especially go into the frog, yeah? Try it. Yeah, the same thing here, it's a separated, yeah, Leonie? Uh, dashes there, right? So I think you should make very clear-cut difference between these two ways of playing this dotted, dotted pattern, right? And here also lower voice uh, leads. So you play fifth and then leave out E. You understand? So those things just, yeah, just try it once. with the rhythm here. I suggest actually look at yeah, to make it really big. Otherwise, ti ta 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 ra ram, yeah, it's possible to save the bow, yeah, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a bit constricting, yeah, so you might consider that. Beautiful playing, unfortunately, we have to stop. We could, we could work on, of course, but we have to move on with the next, our next person, Lenny Bravo. Beautiful play. Thank you very much, Mr. Keller. Looking forward to maybe working with you one of these days, in person. Yeah, it would be great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, please stay safe and healthy. Great. Okay, Vadim, I think we're ready to move on. Yeah. Hello, Margarita. Hello, Mr. Keller. Hello. So this is Margarita Pavlova. She will be performing for us. Recitativo in scherzo by Fritz Kreisler.
Oh, bravo. Beautiful plane. Beautiful plane. It's nice to see that hole. Thank you. Which I haven't seen for many, many, many years, <laughs> and which I played many years ago. A lot. Great. Uh, beautiful plane from violinistic standpoint and intonation, sound, wonderful. Uh, two big things that I would like to pay attention for. One is what I just discussed with the Leonid just before you. In this kind of music, you have to have a very special kind of expressivity when everything is slightly uh, uh, sounded out more clearly. Yeah, what we call musical diction. And especially in case of Isai or Chrysler, even to bigger extent, for whom musical diction was so important. This ability to speak uh, on the instrument. So every note, every little grace note or grace notes a uh, difference between legato and portata should be very clearly defined. Yeah, for example, when you play this, uh, uh, you're doing it, but you kind of connecting them. This note, so it's a, it's articulation mm -hmm. like wa 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 instead of pa 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 bi pa pa. You understand, right? It has to have a little bit more of a consonant character, right? So basically, mm -hmm. if you treat portatas as slow staccato, yeah, with Vibrato. Second phrase, you play. Yeah? So it's a pretty dry stroke in a bow, but if you vibrate, it, it won't sound so dry, you understand? But you cannot connect them. Uh, because then, especially in that acoustics in which you recorded it, right? In, uh, in the Mali mm -hmm. Zal, right? It, when you play in this river, big reverberation, you have to slightly exaggerate it, yeah? Kind of mm -hmm. over-pronounce, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the English word? Enunciate. That. Can we try? So from the very beginning, also, these two grace notes, very easy to lose. Uh, uh, yeah? You're playing them a little bit too mm -hmm. quick, too quickly. Uh, um, last notes. Uh, Always speak them, uh, not just, yeah, because if you're in a small room, yes, it's possible mm -hmm. to hear, but if you're in a bigger hall, usually these notes get swallowed, yeah, and it's difficult to hear. Can you try that, mm -hmm. please? Just from the beginning. Beautiful. That was absolutely beautiful. Now, can I ask you for one more thing, Rita? So the first note, make sure you actually start it from the string. And when I say from the string, I mean the bow should really be settled on the string. And vibrato should start exactly the same time, totally synchronized with the beginning of the stroke. Uh, because in your case, it was... You see? So the first note, when you depart from first note D, which is the main key of this piece, yeah, you have to also speak it more. Yeah. Then even if you play very softly, all of it will be heard in the hall, you understand? In a bigger space. Try that. you have to play E, you almost run out of bow. You see? You have to have a little bit of extra always here. And you can wait for longer. So this way you start speaking an instrument, you understand? Yeah, 
even less bow. Very good. Partata, even less bow. Because faster bow moves, more difficult it is for it to stop. Pa, pi, pa, 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 pi. Not so much bow. Oh. See, much more compact. Now, this harmonic you play, but I think it would be more stylish, considering the Chrysler's own playing, to do a little uh, slide before the... Not just, but uh, yeah. Can we try that? Yeah, even slower. Very good. Even slower. Uh, Now, in the next phrase, when it comes to double stops, make sure your vibrato doesn't stop. So it's a... Uh, and this is also very important, that you vibrate the fifth, the interval of fifth, yeah? For some reason, many violinists have this habit of not vibrating fifth. But that's exactly what you should do, because if, if you're afraid that it will be out of tune a little bit, vibrato would be the best way to cover it. So if you keep vibrating... Uh, Very good, very good, yeah. Right. Just a moment. Yeah, once more, and let's move on, yeah. Now, it comes back later, and then you modulate into different key here. So first time, it's still G minor. Uh, Second time. Yeah, you could take a little bit more time there, yeah, because you treat these two cases exactly the same. So it has to be an element of surprise when you have it second time. Uh, now you have repeated things. You understand? Without stopping. Can you try okay. that? Mm. Second time, when you have to... suggestion one of I mean two suggestions first of all it concerns fingering here when you go yeah do not change position here stay with your second finger on E flat just move first finger to F sharp and then play two two and move it half step down to D you understand what I'm talking about yeah try this look look at me So second finger stays on E flat. Let me be more less stays. And then you move to second finger down. That's all. There is no need to shift twice there. You understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't switch to third finger. Stay with the second. Right. Look. 
second finger stays in the same place, yeah? Yeah? And then it moves to, to D. You might, you might consider that, that the finger, yeah? Because it's, it's just too much, too much commotion. Now, second time when the main theme comes, you don't have to play piano second time, like first time. When you start, it's more introspective. When it comes back after this, yeah, there must be some kind of a difference in character and dynamic, yeah? Yeah, it's absolutely a legitimate thing to do. So I think you should you should explore it. Yeah, we don't have to repeat this thing now. Now after you're done with this, wait for longer a little bit. Make the silence more dramatic, because you go immediately to so and wait. Pizzicati in the left with the left hand. Make sure you don't release string mm -hmm. too quickly because it's difficult to hear. Uh... Yeah, first try to press mm -hmm. the string with the finger and then release it. You understand? Otherwise, boom, you just mm -hmm. kind of uh, hitting it and let let it go. You understand? There's mm -hmm. simply not enough enough sound. Yeah. Can we, we try this? Wait. So this open G sounds a little bit like a bell, you understand? Mm -hmm. Slightly louder. Can you try this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would help, Rita, what would help if you turn your hand more towards your pinky, you see, like this? Because you change position of your hand constantly, just especially for pizzicata. If you already hold it like this, look. You see where my pinky is? Small, little pinky. It's already above the G string. Not like this. You see? I keep it outstretched a little bit, your fourth finger. Can you, can you try that? So it has to be completely turned. So the position of hands should be such that the fourth finger is above G, G string. Understand? Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. these notes are also partata then. Yeah, they're not legato. Can you play last phrase? Pronounced very clearly each note. Try that. Yeah. Yeah, separate, separate them. You're not separating. Uh, partata is when the notes are completely separate. Scherzo was very good, very good. You could introduce a little bit more of this Viennese touch by by playing first eight notes a little bit quicker. You understand? Not ta da da bam ba ba bam. They were a little bit too straight. Uh, can you try it? Can you try it? And I would not switch to Detaché right away. Uh, I think the character calls for something much lighter here and more graceful. Uh, maybe the last group of notes. Yeah, can you try it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So playing of the string. Yeah, I think you froze. Can you try it again? Yeah, last one you switch to the tache. And this one. Mm -hmm. I think you froze. Absolutely, that's right. Now, the next phrase, you have pesante, right? It has to be much heavier. So first eight notes, take more time. And then go to tempo. Can you try that? Ta -da Again, make it a little bit more, more grand. Yeah, so don't go, yeah. Yeah, so don't go to the quarter note. Ya ba bi, start like it's the first beat of the bar. Ba ba bi, yam pam pim da da da. And last one also, a little bit heavier. Mm -hmm. Try that. Da da di, first note here. Yeah, and can you make chords a little bit? A little bit longer, which means, by the way, that you should use less bow, not more. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yes, more sustained, sustained sound. Can, can we try that? string too quickly with the bow. You see, you go, yeah, make, retake the rest between chords, shorter. Yeah, uh, no, not like this. Exactly, correct, 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 absolutely. Now, you playing this the way Christ wrote it, of course, with Ricochet, these things. Uh, it's possible, of course, to try to do it, but unfortunately, I never, for example, I tried it many times and um, kind of went on and off of this stroke. It never really delivers the kind of quality that I would expect because we're losing some notes in the chords. So you might consider just using very short detache. It will sound much better, I think. Can you try that? As opposed to ricochet, you understand? Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 exactly. Can you play the whole phrase? Oi. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Correct, correct, that's correct. Now, uh, this part, uh, when you go... stop particularly there. I don't think it's logical uh, mm -hmm. to slow down the tempo. If you could go directly from that uh, 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 chromatic scale, uh, go on after this. And here, because it's a new material, So it doesn't have to be so straightforward. A little bit more capricious, more moody, you understand? Mm -hmm. And at the end, go in tempo to the very end. You can play last pizzicato note with a little delay, yeah, just for humorous mm -hmm. effect. But keep going, keep going. Don't slow down. You understand? Actually, Chrysler mm -hmm. writes no ritardando, no accelerando, yeah? Rather than no ritardando, you understand? So you have to keep, keep, keep going. Can you try that? Can you try that section? I 
it's a good idea to slow down there. It's already, it's, you, it's, it just starts moving in circles. From this point, just go in tempo. If anything, with a little movement forward, try that. To, the idea here, the music should sort of evaporate, you understand? Kind of disappear. Da -da 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 -dum, pop, pop, beep, pop, pop, beep, pop, boom, you know? Mm -hmm. Wonderful, beautiful playing. Thank you. All right, dear guests. So I'll start reading questions now that I see on my screen. Uh, so when and why did you leave Soviet Union? Well, that's a big issue, of course, to discuss. Uh, 1980s was very complex time. Uh, it was time known in the West as Perestroika. This is where Mr. Gorbachev came to power. And, and many things became uh, more open, really. And first of all, a lot of, of course, historic information that uh, was intermittently revealing and disturbing and situation seemed to be very unstable in that country and I felt that that was time when I should go to another part of the world and uh, explore other possibilities and so in 1991 I've got invitation from the Peabody Conservative of Music as a guest professor and I used this opportunity uh, to go to the United States, but I already knew that I probably I wouldn't come back. And uh, that, that was my consideration. Just want to explore better and more opportunities for myself as an artist and, and musician. Who did you study with and where? Uh, my, all my studies uh, uh, were in Russia, in the Soviet Union. My first Pedagogue was a wonderful, wonderful teacher, uh, Zinaida Gilils, from very famous family of Gilils and Kogan. Uh, Gilils was uh, one of the greatest pianists of the 20th century, legendary Russian pianist, Emir Gilils. His uh, sister, Eliz Elizaveta Gilils, who was a wonderful violinist and was a wife of Leonid Kogan, one of my idols. And um, uh, I studied with Zinaida Gilils for about 11 years officially, and somewhere from the age 15 approximately, she started bringing me to Kogan to play for him. It happened, I would say, once a month, once in two months, whenever I had enough repertoire to show to him, and so I played for him quite regularly. Uh, in Moscow Conservatory, I studied with another great Russian-Soviet violinist, Viktor Tritikov, uh, for five years, for six, I think, but one of the greatest influences on me was from a legendary figure of Abram Stern, who was a kind of a violinistic guru in the Soviet Union. He lived in Kiev and was a concert master of the Kiev Opera. And uh, already many accomplished violinists, and not just violinists, even cellists and so forth, would visit him and play for him. He was a kind of a, a wise, wise man of violin, and his playing represented really the kind of style of playing that is not known today anymore really old school, you might say. Yeah. And he knew so much about uh, the violin technique in a sense of how, of how to express things on the instrument. I mean, he knew so wonderful secrets and tricks, and I think I learned from him even more than, in a way, than from my other official teachers. Another question, you won first prize in three most prestigious competitions. What is the special secret Soviet preparation for the competitions? Well, things in the Soviet Union were taken extremely seriously. We were not distracted by too many other things. We didn't go on Facebook, Instagram, and <laughs> uh, places like this. Uh, so we read books and just practiced. So it was like a preparation of a sports team for participation in Olympic Games, you know, or some championship. So a lot of practice. Uh, as I look back, probably too much. 
Um, it was very fashionable to practice for eight, nine, ten hours even a day and so forth. But we had that time to do things. Uh, also, before you were even allowed to go to competition, because being Soviet a musician, you didn't just represent yourself, you represented also your country. So there was a very painstaking preparation process and selection. You would play for, first of all, there would be a, a com contest between uh, people who prepared for competition within the same school. Then it would go on a uh, level of the city, uh, if it would be a certain republic of Soviet Union or national level, and only then it would be decided whether you, you would be selected to go among maybe two or three other participants to that particular competition. So, of course, it was not like uh, today you can just buy a ticket and send your video, and if you accept it, just go anywhere you want. It was not that easy. Uh, sorry asking about Soviet Union, but now living in the West, do you see difference in the musical education between East and West? Yes, there, there are differences, definitely. And I would say that uh, there are pluses and minuses in both types of education. That education was mostly uh, focused on developing your uh, skills as a soloist, mo mostly. Uh, we did some chamber music, but there was not such huge emphasis, like, for example, in the West, which I really appreciate. And uh, uh, orchestras were not, orchestra, orchestral programs were very weak and people were not really taught how to play in orchestras. And uh, orchestra generally was not perceived as something of a very prestigious work like in the West. In the West, orchestral job is really, mean, really means a lot and gives you a very high status. And especially if you have a title chair, if you concert master, that's a really a great status. Uh, you hinted at the beginning of the class that there are more things to be said about special link between this is a sonata dedicated to Christ and Christ's own composition. Would you care to elaborate? Yeah, what I meant actually, not this particular piece, I just meant that is I wrote the sonata for Christ, so like he wrote other sonatas for other um, of his great younger colleagues, Sigeti and Escu, uh, third sonata, Kriegbom, uh, um, and, and so forth, uh, and Thibaut. Uh, in each one of those sonatas, is I try to replicate in his mind how he perceived the individual styles of performance of this of these great people, and so I think in this sonata you can hear very clearly um, uh, reference even to Christ's music itself. Like for example, a third moment starts with this uh, gesture uh, and so forth, which is obviously relates to. Yeah, things like that. And of course, uh, certain things that I talked about as far as expression and articulation, that definitely, definitely refers, refers to Christ. Uh, there's a very interesting also uh, correspondence that exists between I Isaiah and Christ, where uh, Christ suggests that in the second movement of fourth sonata, you start with a little vamp, something that you don't have in the music. Dum, dum. And then... Uh, And then you launch into movement itself. And there's a correspondence in which Isaiah uh, heartily agrees with that and thinks that this is really a great idea. But it never made its way into music itself. What violin and bow are you using? The violin looks as... as yes, uh, my violin is a modern instrument. It's made by great maker, uh, Joseph Curtin, Canadian by birth. He grew up in England and now lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He's one of the leading violin makers of today's world, in my opinion. And this is a violin number six that I own of his. I started uh, collaborating with him in 1990s and intermittently using other instruments uh, on loan. I played on J.B. Guad, on Strad, and, uh, and recently on Guarneri del Jesus and Hauser. But I always came back to this instrument. Uh, and his violins were my primary instruments on which I recorded and performed throughout the world. Where do you teach during the year? During the year, I'm a violin and the violin faculty of the very, very famous school in the United States, the Cleveland Institute of Music. I believe there's a lack of listening to opera singers from whom we can learn a lot about breathing, phrasing, and especially expressivity. Do you encourage your students to listen to opera? Definitely. I mean, I cannot really grab them by their hand and make them listen, but I constantly refer during my lessons to singing. And not only singing, it's also about you think of old dra dramatic actors. 
when I talked about articulation and enunciation. I think this is so important and there's such direct connection and parallels between what we're doing with music and reading text in a very, very special way. So I think music is a, is a poetry of sound and I think it should be treated like that. So when you read poetry, you, it, it's not like reading a newspaper. Obviously, it's a different approach to the text. Uh, and do you encourage them to listen to older generation of violinists? Definitely. In fact, very often I send them links with old uh, recordings, um, of archive recordings. It, not every young, every young person has a skill of listening to old archive recordings um, uh, because it doesn't sound as perfect from digital standpoint as uh, new recordings, but you can learn so much from it. Besides, there's a historic connection. You, it's, a, it's a testimony to how things were treated in music, again, in terms of articulation, tempi, and approach, and so forth. This highly individualized way of performing, I think it's very refreshing, and you can learn a lot from it. I think we're done with questions. Thank you, everybody, who was present at this class, uh, and I hope everybody will stay safe and healthy, and we'll see each other in person next year in Keshet Elon. Cannot wait. Thank you.